Hello all, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to look at this here Bose AW1 acoustic wave music system and finally try to fix it. This video is way overdue. I was supposed to get to this in December, or at least I was planning to get to it in December, but uh, for the life of me I just couldn't get up enough interest to, to actually do the work until now. Reason being, I had to uh, actually take this thing into work the other day at my church job there. We were doing annual report booklets and I didn't want to pass the time just standing there collating all these booklets without any music, so I decided to bring this with me and I remembered real quick that this thing has problems. Not with the auxiliary input, because that's the only thing that literally works on it, but uh, with everything else. So hopefully that's what we're going to look at today. But before we do that, I just want to beg your indulgence for a second. Now that I've got that Sony MDS E10 working, I am all in on Minidisc now. Basically what I've been doing is, 12 Volt Vids did a video the other day saying how tape was dead and uh, if we're not careful we could be losing access to all our audio tapes and video tapes and whatnot. And, uh, well, I disagree with him with the with what he said about tape being dead. I do agree that we should be backing up all our old cassettes. And I've decided to do that with Minidisc. Sort of. Kind of. In a way. I'm actually doing multiple formats here. But anyway, these are three of my old mixtapes I made in the 80s when I was just uh, 12, 13, 14 years old. And... Uh, I decided that these tapes were far too important to me to just uh, let sit on a shelf degrading. And so what I've been doing is I've been uh, pulling all of these into the computer into FLAC files using my Nakamichi BX150. And then not only am I storing them on uh, a RAID array in the computer with the FLAC files, I'm going to be converting said FLAC files to MP3 to shove into my phone, and I'm also using Minidisc as well. In fact, this is one of them. Let's see, this is this tape right here. And uh, I'm having a, a real struggle with myself to uh, figure out where to go next because uh, I kind of always wanted to uh, remaster some of these tapes just to see how good these tapes really were. Got a screwdriver rattling around my table right now. This is one of them. This is a Vivox UHE-90. Not a very good tape, but uh, yeah. Basically, the, the machine I made this on was my uh, Pulsar CC4000 boombox, the one I got at age 12 from my mother for a birthday present. And the struggle is, I don't think 12-year-old me would want this uh, being overwritten in any way, even to remaster it. With possibly one exception. While I was making these tapes back in the day, all I wanted was a TAC V900X so I could record better quality. And uh, I think 12 year old me would be just fine with me remastering maybe this tape or possibly this tape with the V900X. So I'm trying to figure out what I want to do with that. The UHE-90 has this wonderful, warm, analog sound to it now. It's distorted because that boombox didn't have a very good tuner in it, but uh, it sounds so nostalgic to leave it this way. And... Uh, it sounds no less nostalgic on this mini disc, so uh, maybe it's okay if I have it on this mini disc and I can just plug this into a machine and listen to it that way. Maybe it's okay if I use the V900X to remaster this tape. Yeah, the sun always shines on TV. By far AHA's best song off that album. Not even close is uh, Take On Me. Anyhow, we gotta get to our topic for today which is this thing here now I know all the uh, the standard arguments with this company buy other sound equipment 
No highs, no lows, must be bows. Well, that's often true with bows, but sometimes they got it right, and uh, this is one of the times they got it right. Back in the 80s, in 1984 or so when this was introduced, there was nothing out there for boomboxes that could do what this one does, and that's have halfway decent sound quality. The boombox I always wanted back then is the JVC... Oh, what is it? The PC... 550 or something like that and uh, I've heard from owners of those boxes that they don't really sound that good of course we always had the the big Lasonics and Claritones and uh, Helixes but those were always expensive I couldn't afford one and uh, even then they're they're not known for being extremely reliable or or even that good sounding this box is good sounding it's designed to be good sounding so uh let me just fire up my uh, source device so I can show you exactly what works on this thing. I'm going to use the uh, DCC300 because it's got the remote. And we'll turn this on. And I will show you right now just how it sounds. And I'll switch over to the phone camera for this because it's in stereo. So yeah, there you go. I hope I didn't blow out the uh, the volume on the recording there, but yeah, we've got issues with the volume pot up there. Have to clean them all, but that goes without saying. It's from 1984. Of course, it's going to have uh, issues there, but uh, I'll show you what happens up here. I'm going to tilt this forward because I don't have a better way to show you. Tuner is completely dead. We've got damage to the LCD up there. I don't know if I can do anything for this tuner at all. It's still powered up right now. In fact, I've got it full, full blast right now. Nothing whatsoever. I've heard there's a 5 volt regulator that goes out on these, but I don't know if it's in the power supply or where it is. And I don't know if it's even applicable to the tuner but uh, let's move over to the tape deck here again still powered up i try to get this so you can see something in there it does make noise so the motor works we got a little rewind action going in there take up reel is not moving And these buttons don't stay down because the uh, stop button is permanently pressed in. That's the power button there. So yeah, tape deck needs a full service as well. Consumer Direct Division, that's the only way you could buy these back in the day. And they were expensive. And that is the one thing I don't like about this company. They're always overpriced and... Uh, uh, how do I say this? They're extremely picky about uh, giving out service information. Like, they won't do it at all. But uh, fortunately, the schematics for this unit have leaked out over the years. So uh, I've actually got a way to, uh, to access service information. Looks like there's a DC jack in there somewhere. Let me play with this. Oh yeah, there is a DC jack there. Cool. Anyhow, that's the device we're working on today. I was hoping to find one that had the uh, carrying bag that goes with this thing, but uh, could not find one of those. And usually when I find one of those, sellers are asking something stupid like 150 bucks for one. I'm not paying that much for a carrying bag. I'm sorry. It's not going to happen. But uh, yeah. As far as, as far as boom boxes go, this was ahead of everything else in the in the 80s when it was made. By the 90s, everybody else caught up. Like my uh, 
Panasonic RX DT901 over there, that thing can compete with this one. The DS50, not so much. Enough talk, we need to start getting into this thing. And the first thing I'm going to have to do is take the uh, cassette lid off. This one does eject, as you can see. But I want to show you how to do this without uh, ejecting the cassette, because sometimes the door gets stuck down on these things. Basically, you can just undo the, uh, the cassette door by moving it towards the front and just lifting it off like that. It can be done without uh, having to open the door. Now we got to get in here and hopefully figure out why the tuner is acting up. Hope y'all can see everything. We got to get the uh, antenna off first, according to the service manual, which got leaked out, and I'm very grateful to whoever did that. I want to put this uh, screw back in before I lose it. Like so, I will put the antenna off to the side. And I do have the schematics printed out here in case I need them, and I probably will need them. Okay, what have we got going on here? The service manual ta tells you how to take all this stuff apart, but uh, I don't want to go consult it right now. So I'm just going to start taking screws out and see how far I get with this. I don't know if this needs to come out or not. It's for the antenna. But yeah, I hope I can get this fully working because this is exactly the kind of thing my sister would like for playing tapes with. Although I have now tried my RX DT901 with the uh, North American Power Grid and it works just fine, so I could get another one of those for her. Remote control and all that. Okay, that was easy enough. Now, let me see what we got going on here. Obviously, the tuner's over here. I don't think that LCD display is ever going to be fixed. It's a sealed unit, and by the time they get like that, there's usually no fixing them. Maybe I should hold out for something better for my sister. Let me see if I can get you closer. And we'll just take a look at this tuner module here. I want to check some voltages on here. So let me get the uh, power back to the unit. Yeah, that's the thing. As much as I want to give one of these to my sister, I want to keep one for myself, too. So maybe I should find a better one for her. Okay, I see. I don't see an IC. IC must be there somewhere. Ah, yes. IC is there. I saw IC. Oh, okay. That just comes right out the, uh, the antenna thing. I could have just left it in there. Oh well. First thing I want to check to see is whether or not we're actually getting power to the... Uh... Oh, and somebody's been in here before. You know what? That screw is missing. So yes, yeah, somebody has been in here before. Now let me find my uh, multimeter and we'll do some voltage checks on this thing. Now I'm going to consult the schematics here for a second. Okay, ground is pin 1 on this cable down here. It must be that one down at the end. I want to see if there's power going into this board for the, in the first place. Let's see, power comes in from... Where does it come in from? Pin 9 it looks like. Pin 12 is the uh, TB line, which I'm betting does not stand for tuberculosis. At least I hope not. So yeah, the gray wire must be 
the tuberculosis line. Okay, so pin one is down there and uh, I can go from that. Okay, so I want to test between pins one and nine here. Wait, what the heck is going on? Oh, I see. They've got some trickery going here. The ground is way over here. See, it looks like it's a 9-pin connector up here, but on the other side, it's a clearly a 12-pin. Anyway, I need pin 9. Eleven point five seven volts, so I'm going to say that's good. Now we need to check pin 7 at this chip here. And how the hell am I going to do that? All right, we can check at Q204. I'll just show you here. This is the one I'm looking for. We've got power coming in, so we need to check this voltage regulator right now, Q204. I bet you that's shot. Okay, C19, the positive side of that, we can get that voltage. It's 22 microfarads at 10 volts. Where is that? This is a 0 0.022. That's a 10 volt 220 there. What about this other one down here? I bet that's the one. Now that's 10 at 220. What the heck? I bet you Q204 is this transistor right here between the yellow capacitors. What's this other one over here though? 1730. That's what it says. We're looking for a 2S... Oh, there's another one over there. Great. Okay, yeah, C1730, that corresponds to what that marking is on that transistor. So I'm betting the one we're looking for is actually this one down in here. Don't know if you can see that. So we want to look for about 15 volts going into it and uh, 5 volts coming out of it. So... These three pins up here, we're going to check. Hopefully my meter stays on. Got six volts there. 17 volts there. Five volts there, so that's working. So why do we not have anything happening? Now, let's see if we can try to trace this together. This is Q204 right there. Let me zoom you out so you can actually see what I'm doing here. This is Q204. The output goes up to uh, R210 here. We can check that resistor. And D202. But... Uh, yeah, the power going into the chip comes out of R204 up there. So if this diode's failed, that could cause this. I don't think anything's being pulled to ground, so I don't think these capacitors would have been failed, or would be failed. we got to find R204 and test that. It's 100 ohm, it looks like. Okay, so these three pins up here are Q204. I'm going to go on that assumption. We've got a 273 marked resistor there. That would be 27 kilo ohms. That should be R210 right there. Which connects to R211, which is 100K. Okay, I think I'm starting to figure this out. There's a 273 marked resistor here. I think that's R210. Comes right up over here. Let me see if I can show you we'll get you off the tripod so the two resistors i'm looking at are right here this 273 right there and the 104 above it i think because those connect directly to each other the 273 is uh 
this one here and the 104 is this one here, R210 and 211. So we need to find this junction to get that diode. Let's see if I can find it here with you on camera. Let's see. Junction should be coming right off of uh, that pin right there. And the diode would have to be on the other side of the board, and it is. It's right there. So, how about we check that? I know where it goes now. I can test it. Okay, diode. We got 5.5 .5 volts at one side and 4.95 on the other. So that's working. Great. So this chip is getting power. So yeah, I'm going to try to do some resoldering on this board and we'll see what happens. We'll try it now. Not a thing. Yeah, the tuner's probably croaked. However, I have the uh, main schematics here. This is half of it here. And there's a notation here that somebody has written in on one of these uh, lines that goes into the tuner. And I'm thinking maybe I should check those voltages as well. I can get that at pin three of the tuner, so I don't need to actually get inside under here to the lower circuit board. Might might end up doing that anyway, but uh, I'm not gonna worry about it. It says 0 0.6 radio off and uh, something radio on, 4.2 radio on, I think. And that comes out of Q102 on the uh, main board down here. Yeah, there's nothing there. I bet that's the problem. So yes, we do need to get inside here to the lower control board, or to the lower board, or whatever. I don't know. We can do that. Okay, the styrofoam's been vacuumed, and we can now start getting into this thing, I think. I hope. Just gotta start freeing up wires here. Oscillator trimmer, oscillator coil, AM, fine tuning, FM fine tuning, I think, FMIF. Uh, this is not the easiest thing to service, but it's not as bad as I thought it was. Or as, or as I thought it would be, I should say. I'm tempted to take a look at one of these tweeters while I've got it apart this far, but I think I'll leave those alone. So, what is next? Well, we're going to have to free up this little doohickey here in order for me to pull the uh, circuit board out. So I can start testing things. And yeah, I'm surprised just how gung-ho I am about Minidisc just having done the one unit. Aside from backing up my old uh, mixtapes, what I'd like to do with it is use it for my... Uh, longer vaporwave stuff because it's become very clear to me that uh, VHS is not going to be the uh, MacGuffin I thought it would be for doing such a thing. So long story short, I've got two more mini disc units coming in from Japan right now. One's a consumer unit, a Marantz CM6200, which has a uh, a C CD player built into it. I thought that was important because I still don't have a CD player with optical outputs. And the other one is completely unplanned. I just won that auction two days ago. 
There is a Pro Audio JVC unit available only in Japan. And apparently nobody wants those things. Nobody. They're MDLP compatible, which boggles my mind that nobody would want them. But anyhow, long story short is I found one of those things that was sitting there with zero bids. $17 opening bid, so I thought, what the hell? I'm going to put 20 bucks on that auction and see if I get it. Well, folks, nobody bid against me. I won it for 17 bucks. So I've got a JVC Pro Audio Mini Disc Unit, and by the way, that one has a three-disc CD changer built into it. So that should be fun for the channel. So I will try to zoom you in here. So you can see what I'm looking at. Should probably resolder that connector while I'm at it. Okay, so pin three will be either this land or this trace here, or let's see, this trace here. What goes what goes that two does? It's a jumper wire that ends up over here and runs down beneath this capacitor to this IC here, LA3410. See if I can find that. Where is LFA3410? Could be the FM front end chip. I don't see a uh, part number on the schematics, which would be great to find. But I'm guessing that's pin nine. Yeah, there it is. There's LFA or LA3410 right there. That's the uh, MPX chip, is it? I don't know. So pin three is going to be this one up at the top here. I bet it's this transistor right here we're looking at. So let me get my meter out again. And we'll do the diode check in that. Okay, so the transistor in question is right here. Meter is working. It's just this transistor looks like it's completely dead. Oh wait, there we go. 0 0.651 there. meter not making good contact. Maybe it is bad. Oh no, wait. It's good. So, we've got a dead tuner and I can't figure out why. Great. This has very clearly been serviced before. There's a bunch of flux around some of these joints. Some of it is factory, like up in here. That's factory flux, but this is after factory repair work flux over there. Someone has resoldered those transistors. And someone else will be resoldering them today. Me! All right, folks. Day one and a half update. I decided I couldn't leave, let the uh, tuner issue rest, and I had to do some more voltage checks and measurements and uh, discover exactly what was going on with it. And I have discovered what is going on with it. I will show you on the schematics here if I can, if I can get it the right way around. Okay, so the problem is this AR plus B, that's missing. And I mean totally missing. It's dead. There's nothing coming in there. So uh, I went back to uh, this schematic again. This is an incredibly confusing schematic. And let's see if I can point it out to you. The AR plus B voltage comes in right here and it comes up over here and down here to this line and it ends up or actually originates from this transistor here q109 now when the set is on and working we should get 14.3 uh, volts there at the emitter i believe and something similar to that up here and then you should get 9.3 at the collector. 
and that 9.3 is missing. It's measuring something like 200 millivolts. So I'll show you where that is on the board here. That particular transistor is, uh, let's see if I can find it, this one right here. I've tried reflowing it, does nothing. I've got 18 volts on this pin. I've got 17.4 volts here, which is a little high, so maybe there's something going on with this that caused it to, uh, to fry this transistor. All I know is this does not test bad with the uh, diode check. It tests good. But uh, yeah, this is where the AR plus B, that's where our 9.3 volts is supposed to be coming out of. And it's supposed to be going up through here to this pin. And I've just got the same 200 and something millivolts there. So this transistor's dead. I think that's the only issue. I'm not exactly sure. It has to be the only issue because we're getting 17 point something here and 18 volts here. So yeah, I think if I replace this transistor, the tuner would start working again. Don't quote me on that. I don't know tuners very well. You guys will have to tell me if you agree with this or not, but uh, yeah, that little transistor is dead. And if I want the tuner to come back online, that's going to have to be replaced. I'll have to see if I can find a replacement and maybe one that's rated for a little more power than this one. I don't know. Anyhow, let's get on to the uh, cassette deck. All right, we're ready to go with some hot and heavy cassette deck action here, I hope. Now, off camera, I decided to go ahead and clean the uh, controls on the uh, control panel there, and I applied some fader lube as well, because that's a thing I've got now. Decided you guys probably don't need to see that section, because uh, it's basically self-explanatory anyway, how all that stuff works, but uh, just checking out the uh, mechanism here. This appears to be completely proprietary to Bose, so uh, I don't know if this will work for any other deck at all, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Let's get into it. And the first thing we're going to want to do is probably change these belts, because they are not very good, at least from what I can tell. So we might as well start there. Thank you, Vessel, for making such awesome tools. It's making short work of this stuff up here, I gotta say. Actually, does that need, even need to come off? I don't think so. Let me retighten that. I think we gotta get to uh, this plate from this side here. Yes, that's the right screw. There's nothing in the service manual about servicing the cassette deck portion of this, so we're going to have to learn as we go. Okay, one long screw, two short ones to get this plate off. And there is a little micro switch here, or leaf switch, whatever you prefer. I'm going to hit that with contact cleaner now so I don't forget about it. Kind of scrub the contacts together just a little bit. Very likely that powers up the whole mechanism or something. It does something anyway, I'll tell you what. All right, we'll get this belt off. And we'll get this belt off. Yeah, that belt is no good. And neither is this one. So... What are we looking for for size here? I can tell you right now this is a one millimeter thick belt. I'm gonna have to go with my 1.2s because that's all I got. And we got 94.6 millimeters. So that's about, well, we'll just call it 95. Times two, that would be 190. So divide by 1.07 to get the new belt circumference, internal circumference. And I can't think real good, so I'll do that off camera. 
when we get to that part and we'll check the uh, main capstan belt here this is going to be three millimeters wide i don't know if i've got one i don't know if i've not not got one if that makes any sense and we've got 135 for this one so times two would be 270. again divide by 1.07 get the new belt and I'm just gonna shut you off right now so I can go get that ready okay so I found a couple of belts without realizing there's a third one hiding down in there we're gonna have to look for as well I found this one for the real drive that's this pulley up here I'll show you what it measures at About 90, that's about what you want for this. And as for the uh, main capstan belt, I found a deck tech one that works. It's this one right here, four millimeters by 0 0.55 by 79 millimeter diameter. So that's the one I'm gonna use. And I just hope that this one's gonna be good because it seems like these Chinese belts are kind of losing their, uh, their tack, if you will. But uh, that's neither here nor there. We gotta find out what this uh, third belt entails. And it looks like to even get at that belt, the capstan has to come off. Or the flywheel, anyway. But we have to do that anyway, just to service this. And there is an oil keeper in front, so remember that's there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find my uh, dental pick. Oh, this belt is severely stretched definitely needs to be done that's probably why this thing doesn't want to work for us anymore so i'm going to get my finger under there underneath where the capstan is i'm just going to pull this off set it to the side and i'm going to grab this oil retaining washer doohickey thing and i'm just going to put it right back on the capstan for now i'll, I'll clean this up and uh, Keep track of it there later but uh, yeah this is much thinner than the other I bet it's a 0 0.7 and it is so uh, what do we got dealing with here we'll have to do the calculations all over again but uh, we've got 76.5 for this so times 2 divide by 1.07 to get the new belt Alrighty then, folks, shall we get this thing finished up? I'm ready, definitely, to get this done. I'm not sure if I'm going to be doing a uh, full, complete service on this. A lot of this lube seems like it's in actually quite decent shape, but uh, I'm betting there's still some stuff here to do. And before we really get into this, I wanted to make sure and let you know that uh, I have transistors coming for the tuner on this uh, AW1. I'm going to make one attempt and one attempt only to get that tuner working and we'll see if we can do it. And yes, it has occurred to me that maybe there was something else pulling down that uh, uh, B plus rail to the tuner, but uh, if there is, I can't find it. I've tested everything in that circuit. I've measured that uh, voltage without the uh, tuner even, or without the uh, tuner board this thing actually even being in the circuit and it the voltage still isn't there so yeah I even replaced uh, one of the uh, capacitors on the main board for that rail and no good nothing's bringing it back so it has to be something to do with a transistor at least in my mind if anybody out there hasn't has some experience with that and would like to correct me on that just let me know and if there's something else going on, maybe I'll look into it, but uh, I'm going to try a new transistor when it gets here. It cost me 10 bucks for like 10, or 10 of them from China or something like that, so anyhow, I did find that third belt. This is a, a one millimeter wide, uh, or is it one millimeter? Yeah, it's one millimeter wide by 140 millimeters internal circumference. So I'm going to use that one. It's a round belt. Should work. But, uh, yeah. 
I did have a wire break off here, so I'm going to have to reattach that. It's just a ground wire. I'll be doing that by and by. It just goes on right down there. But uh, let's get in real close and we'll see if we can uh, figure out why she was jamming up. Oh, right there. That's real gummed up right there. This is the mechanism that raises and lowers the head block, so... Yeah, that's going to have to come off for uh, re-lubing, for sure. That's moving well, but we'll re-lube everything as long as we're in here. Yeah, see, it kind of comes around like this to engage the heads. And then it's supposed to pop back down and it's not doing that because it's all gummed up. So yeah, we'll make that happy again. I don't think there's anything wrong up in this assembly here. This is responsible for the real drive. Nothing up here is in bad shape. So I don't know exactly how far to go with this. Yeah, that's moving real well. All this stuff is. I'll throw some molly coat in there by and by. But uh, before I do anything with the uh, real drive potentially, I want to get this uh, beauty plate off the front here, this little metal piece, just so I can see what the real drive looks like under there. And also get this uh, big plastic piece out of the way. So how about let's do that right away. just leave it like this for now. Now we've got one screw, oh no, two screws for this metal piece. And those are the same as the uh, hinge screws that just came out. And I've already oiled the, uh, the, uh, the front bearing and the uh, motor off camera. I'm not exactly thrilled with this motor. I think there might be some issues with it, but uh, I'm also not planning on changing it. Okay, so what have we got here? There is a rubber idler here. I hope it's in good shape. The good news is I don't think there's going to be any obstacle to uh, removing that assembly from underneath. Yeah, the actual sliding plate of the head block assembly seems to be fairly well lubed. It's just that little arm in the on the other side that's keeping it from uh, behaving correctly. So we'll come around to this side and we'll see what we can do for her. Try to get you lined up so you can see what I'm doing here. Okay, I'm going to start with the problem child here first. All right, we're going to have to worry about this spring here because it's attached to part of this. It's attached to this arm right here, this one. So, uh... I'll release this E-clip first. C-clip removed. Off comes the arm and I'll free up the spring. There we go, like so. Now the next thing to remove is this gear. Off comes the gear. It was lubed at one point, but there's not much left. Okay, the next part is to remove the stubborn gummed up uh, arm here. I'm 
just going to work it back and forth as I sort of apply a little pressure with a dental pick and it should come right off. Yeah, that was bad in there. Okay, so let me just check here. And yeah, all of those are moving freely, so I'm not going to worry about them. This gear right here is not moving very freely. That one right there. I think I'm going to want to do something about that. But uh, first, we got to clean up these uh, arms that we just took off here. I'll do this first. With isopropyl alcohol. And then I'm going to get the acetone for this part because it looks really bad. There's no plastic around, so I'm not too worried about uh, destroying plastic right now. This needs to be clean. Man, I'm tired. I've been playing taxi literally all week for family. And it's starting to catch up with me. And yet another pass is required. I wasn't expecting this to be quite this bad, but it is. And while I've got the Q-tip out and sort of soaked, I will clean off the other shafts as well. That should be ready to go back together already. So I'll grab me some Molly coat. should do the job. Smear it all around there and get my fingers nice and greasy. And what do I need here? I need this uh, arm again. And I'm going to put some molly coat on anything the uh, the arm touches just to make sure there's lots of lube here now let's see it goes down like this I'm gonna smear a light coating on the underside as well all right let's put this on and see how it does immediate improvement. I just want to go over to the other side here because I saw a spring that I don't know if is in the right position. I think it must be. Pardon me a second while I get the styrofoam out of there. Don't ship your stuff in styrofoam. It makes people like me unhappy. Yeah, I'm going to say that's probably the way that's supposed to go. Thankfully, I see no broken pieces here with this gear. That's always nice. All right, now what do I have to lube here? Very likely I need to uh, spread some lube down in here, because that's where that gear goes. That is very likely more than enough. Okay, that seems pretty good.
All right, a little more molly coat is required for the top of the gear. And we'll clean this little arm now. All right, guys, I think I got this. Just want to kind of show you exactly how this mechanism works real quick. If I can. Here's how this works, this mechanism. This is the play slider right here, which is triggered by the play button down here. And when you press play, it pulls this arm down so that this gear can engage the gear on the capstan flywheel. And then the uh, motor runs it this way. Then it gets to a certain point here where it just stops. And this is in play mode right here. So that's how this deck is uh, able to play. And then when you go to stop playback, what happens is it just resets the whole thing. That's how that works. Just checking this arm here, it seems to be okay. I think we'll relube this arm and this gear, and maybe this arm too. But uh, what I kind of want to do first is I want to get the uh, this part out of the way here, just to see what's underneath. Let's see here. There's one spring we're gonna have to detach, I think. Well, maybe I don't need to detach that right now. Actually, it's this spring we're going to have to detach right now. The one that goes to this arm right here. Like so. And I think this will let us get this whole assembly out now. So let's give that a shot. Oh, this pulls out the entire real assembly. And I wonder if I can even get it out because it's... Uh... Oh yeah, there we go. Okay, there's our real drive assembly right here. And I'm going to get to be able to uh, take a closer look at this rubber idler. While we're at it. Let me see if I can find my flashlight. Idler could use a clean, but it looks like it's all right. But yeah, I think we can leave this whole assembly alone pretty much except for cleaning. It's all moving fairly well. Those brakes are looking good. Lube is still holding up. So let me check this gear here. Oh, that is just seized right up, or it was. I don't know if it is now. Yeah, that has to be lubricated. So in order for me to get at that a little easier, I think what I'm gonna have to do is, well, actually, I probably would have had to, uh... oh no, I can get it out this way. For a minute there, I thought I had to re remove this uh, large gear here, but I don't have to, I don't think. Okay, now this arm has a little spring going to it from the uh, chassis here, so keep that in mind. And it engages with a little tab that's down in here. I 
I'm just going to dangle it off to the side like that for now. While I pop this other clip off and gear. And now I've got access to this arm. So yeah, I hope I can get the tuner to come back around on this thing, but uh, I'm not holding my breath on it. I'm giving myself maybe a 50% shot at fixing it. But uh, like I've said before, there are no radio stations around here anyway, so not sure how big of a deal that is. Okay, we've got a shaft here held on by a split washer. Rather, this gear is held on by a split washer. Actually, it can be rotated right up out of the way there, it looks like. But what I'm thinking is, I remove that split washer so I can get this entire arm out. That's what I'm thinking. So that's what I'm doing. Just like that. And yeah, this gear is seized up solid. Oh, we've got a spring under there, too. I bet that's going to be fun to figure out where it goes. Oh, wait, I know where it goes. It goes right here. There's a little hook right there. So I'll reattach that. Shouldn't be too hard. But uh, meantime, i got to get this gear off of this little arm. How am I going to do that? And I'm already getting indications that this gear is very soft material, so don't be too forceful with it. All right, that little washer's off. Now we can pull the gear off. You probably didn't see any of that. Oh boy. That just pulled right out, that shaft. It's not supposed to be like that, I don't think. Oh, I see. The gear is actually retained in somehow. It has to come out from the bottom. So I have to remove it like that somehow. I think. Okay, now I can get it off the shaft. That is some of the worst dried up old grease I've ever seen. I gotta clean this little shaft slash pin off somehow so I can get it back together properly and have this gear actually gear itself again. Look at all the garbage that's coming off that. But it's mostly clean now. At least I believe it is. I don't know what kind of grease they used at the factory for this, but actually it probably wasn't grease, it was probably oil. That's the impression I'm getting anyway. Oh yeah, it's going to work now. Well, it would appear I got that right, so I will continue with my operations here. Just cleaning everything so I can reinstall everything. So hopefully that gear's happy now. I don't know if it's going to be perfect or not, but as long as it stays in, it should be fine. It's the staying in part I'm kind of worried about now because uh, it really, that shaft really came out of easily of the uh, the arm but uh, as long as it stays in it should be okay so yeah the way this arm goes in is uh, that little ridge part goes upwards with a shaft like that so I'm going to reinstall that gear but I'm going to put the arm back in first so I can get the spring re-engaged a little better So we need some molly coat.
And let me see. I think this is ready to go in. Yes, and I see another place to molly coat. Just wanna put a little bit on the end of this arm here just to make sure there's plenty of lube in there. And the spring is back on. So, what I'm gonna do for this gear is kind of the same thing I do for uh, clutches. I'm just gonna put molly coat inside the actual shaft hole here. And I'm gonna let the uh, gear push it through. Or let the shaft push it through, whatever. Uh, you know what I mean. All right, gear is happy. And I'm probably gonna have to clean off the uh, molly coat on this shaft here so I can, whoops, don't wanna do that. Come back, settle down. Let's see, what do I gotta do now? Well, I should grab my uh, pipe cleaner again and try to clean up these other arms. And other assorted things that need to be cleaned. I hope I'm putting this back together right. My brain is just fried today. Okay, I think we are making progress here. I think we're making progress. Could be I'm making negative progress without realizing it. But I don't think so. I think we're doing all right. And I will clean that capstan bearing by and by. I want to get done this, uh, this whole assembly up here first. having a look at how this thing works. You probably can't see anything I'm doing again. Okay. So this shaft turns that gear in the middle. Interesting how they've got this set up. First thing we're gonna have to do is clean this pulley off because it's had old belt goo in it for God knows how long. The good news is if I get another one of these it's going to be a lot easier now that I've done it once. I'm just glad I pulled it down far enough to uh, figure out how bad that grease was in that tiny gear on the other side over here. That guy. And now it's moving really freely. It's much happier. Just taking a look at all these gears down in here. This must be part of auto stop or something. But yes, I'm going to have to clean this uh, idler for sure. I hope it doesn't need replacing, because if it does, I don't have one. Yeah, it's get, got a little dirt on it. Just cleaning the side of the reel table here as well. Looks like the other reel is driven off of the uh, this belt here. Or this pulley here. So it's got a different belt for for each of the forward and reverse directions it looks like. Yeah it's got a take up idler in rubber and it's got a rewind idler in uh, gear drive. It would, as, it would certainly appear. Okay now what am I doing next? 
other than losing my mind. Oh yes, I have to clean that with distilled water, that idler. All right, that should do it. And I think we can reinstall this back in the uh, main part of the mechanism. And I see that spring has come off again on that little tiny gear. So can I get that without seriously inconveniencing myself? I don't know how that spring came back off again, but it did. Not the easiest spring in the world to get back on either. Could barely even see that little brat. But it's okay, we got her. Just occurred to me I should measure at least the outer dimensions of this idler while I'm here. Just in case I need it. 12.8 millimeters. Looks like it's possibly... Try this again. Yeah, 12.8 externally and uh, I'm going to say 9 millimeters internally or 8.9 is what I got here. And height is going to be probably 1.5 millimeters, it looks like. Maybe two millimeters. That's the best I can do for now, I think. I gotta try and get this little brat in here again. That little friggin' spring came off again. I'm starting to hate that thing. I might actually have to remove the entire motor bracket in, other, in order to get the uh, assembly back in, because this uh, gear is now spring-loaded and uh, does not want to go back in where it belongs, because it's being blocked up here. Yeah, I'm going to take that bracket off. It's not sitting down properly yet. And I don't know why. I need to access the front before I can figure out why. It's the brakes, that's why. Brakes are binding up, up up top here. Now something else is binding up and I don't know what it is. It's the idler. See, it looks like this idler has to come over on this side because the, uh, the head block plate pulls it up out of the way when it's not required. Thanks for being tricksy, Bose. Appreciate it. Just trying to get all these levers and stuff back in where they're supposed to go is a pain. I think I got it, but don't quote me on that. Try to run a couple screws in here and then I'll see if the uh, actual mechanism works. All right, that should be enough to at least come back up here and check what's the deal. Okay, I've engaged play mode. Now if I can just move the gear Okay, it's in play now. And yes, that is exactly how that works with the idler. So I'm gonna want some molly coat on this surface here. Okay, where's stop? It's here somewhere, for Pete's sake. I had it before, there it is. 
Yeah, so I'm gonna molly coat up here while I'm thinking about it. So, unless there's something else to do up here, and I don't believe there is, I can put the beauty plate back on. If I can find the screws for it, that is. Not sure where I set them down at this point, because like I said, exhausted. Ah, eh, pinch roller's not so great. I should pull that off and clean that too. Should, I don't know if I will. Just looking at how hard it would be to get access to it and it's uh, not entirely pleasant. I would have to pull this button assembly off and I'm not sure if I want to do that. On the other hand, it doesn't look that difficult, so... Alright, I've got access now. And I see I put the beauty plate on wrong. I'll just fix that real quick now. It's supposed to go under these clips. Now it's fine. At least it should be. Let me check that little teeny tiny spring again. No, it's still there. It's still in place. I'm paranoid about it now. Looks like these uh, buttons here just hook into the uh, mechanism below, so I'm not going to worry too much about getting it wrong. And just worry about putting that uh, E-clip back on later. Okay, there is one spring to worry about on this. Let me get it off the shaft and I'll show you. It's right there. And it just clips on to that little arm there. And this arm is cracked right there. It shouldn't be too big of a deal, but it's kind of annoying all the same. But it's going to mean it's going to be real easy, like so, to pop that shaft out. All right, now pinch roller. What have we got for this one? 12.8 millimeters, so it's going to be a 13 millimeter if you want to replace it. 8.1 millimeters hub height, so yeah, standard 13 millimeter by 8 millimeter pinch roller, it looks like. And the shaft is what? 2.3 millimeters. That's kind of non standard, isn't it? Seems that way. Okay, so by now you'll have already seen my uh, video of the Phillips DCC 300. What I'm going to do is the exact same thing on this pinch roller that I did on that one. I'm going to take it up to the kitchen sink. I'm going to get some soapy water going and I'm going to scrub this down with a, a brass brush until I've got this cleaned up. Well, I got the pinch roller cleaned up. It did not respond very well to the uh, brass brush and uh, dish soap. So what I had ended up having to do is uh, go over it with the uh, sandpaper. I don't like to do that because uh, it's really hard to make sure it's perfectly round that way, but uh, in this case I didn't really have much choice. It wasn't responding to the uh, dish soap at all. It really needs replacement, but I do not have a replacement because this is a non-standard uh, shaft size, so it's it's going to have to go back together the way it is. That's the, that's the whole deal here. So that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to Put it back in the machine now with some molly coat on the shaft. All the buttons are engaging properly, I see, so I can screw that back down. 
the power to the tuner goes through the cassette module on this thing, so uh, I'm not 100% sure whether or not it's even going to play the cassette after we put this back together. You'd think it would, but... this side again. Hope everything's working under here. Hard to be sure till it all goes back together. All right, head cleaning time. So one thing we haven't done yet. And there's no telling how many tapes this has played over the years. Must not be too many, because this is not coming away very dirty at all. But yeah, the pinch roller's at least grippy now. It wasn't before. It was totally glazed over. So maybe this will work. Maybe this won't work. Let's see. I think I'm ready to put the uh, hinge back on. Hope I'm ready. All right, one last thing to do that I just about forgot to do is clean the capstan bearing, clean the capstan, all that other good stuff. Time to start the acetone party. I'm going to go in from the front and pull out the back here. And let's see, where is my flywheel? Right here. Fresh, clean paper towel. And I'm going to start doing acetone for all my capstan cleanings now. It's just a little bit more effective than IPA is, and it shouldn't damage anything. Plus, then I get to use the acetone-soaked uh, paper towel on the flywheel surface where the belt rides. Fresh Anderol 456. Nothing but the best for bows. Nope, not in there, self. We don't want it to go in there. Couple of drops will do. And even less would do if you were just uh, supplementing old oil rather than uh, completely replacing it like I am. Because remember I ran the acetone soaked pipe cleaner through that, so uh, it's gotta have the uh, brand new stuff on it. So we got to get belts here. We're getting close guys. Uh, 
Okay, that's happy. I think I forgot a little molly coat application on one of these levers here, so I'm going to do that now. There, that's all I got to do for that. Zoom in just a little bit so you can see what I'm doing here. Next belt. Let's see, are we ready for the big one yet? Actually, yes, that has to go on next. Oh, and I forgot to clean the, uh, the motor pulley. I'll spare myself the acetone this time and just use IPA for this. Because I'm going to be sticking a rubber belt on there immediately, so... Alright, one last belt and then we're ready to put her back together. Theoretically. All right, I think we're done, except for adding a little molly coat there for the uh, thrust bearing. But that's easy enough to do. Now, you mustn't forget, on this mechanism, there's this little spacer here. This goes on this little post right here. That's what that does. Just making sure this leaf, sp or this leaf switch is where it belongs. I'm not sure that it is. So, I figured out what was going on with this micro switch and where this arm is supposed to be, and it turns out I had it right all along. The micro switch engages with this right here. And on this particular unit, it needed adjustment. So I've done that now, and it should be fine once it goes back together. I'll show it to you once it's back together. Give me a second to do that. Okay, there's how that little micro switch is supposed to be. It's, all, it's completely behind that white uh, lever assembly in there. And it's just engaging with the... Uh, Pause button there. Let me show you. So yeah, that's how that works. So it should be all right. I hope it's all right. I think I'm about ready to uh, polish this up, I gotta put the oil keeper back on the uh, capstan. Assuming I didn't lose it, and no I didn't because I just saw it out of the corner of my eye. And uh, yeah, this thing's ready to go back in, in the unit after I fix this wire, of course. I'll heat up the iron now, but uh, first I'm gonna come up top here and just uh, put this oil keeper back on. Well, I can, and I think I'm going to have to clean off the cap stand again, or the uh, pinch roller again, because I see oil on it now. Don't ask me how that happened. It just happened. But that's no problem. We can do that. Okay, let's fix this up real quick, and then we're ready to put it back together. I'll put it back together off camera. Just going to do the end of the wire there just so it acts as a bit of a strain relief. And it looks like I have to uh, solder this down from up top here. So I will do that. Provided I can. Without burning myself, hopefully.
I'm not going to call that my best work, but it'll work for the time being. And this should be ready to go now. So I'm going to get it back in the machine and we'll test and see how it works. And we should be able to do a speed calibration and wow and flutter measurement as well because the unit has a line out. So uh, we'll see how that works. Okay, folks, I think we might be ready to give this a try now. However, I have some suspicions that this uh, pinch roller is going to need a little more work. I'm going to try to bring it back around yet, but we'll see. Just checking here to see if I've got everything in the right spots and everything's good to go. Okay, power's on. Okay, it does play now. This is good. Trying to get some sandpaper on this roller here. It's not very grippy at all. I can easily stop it. This might actually need some rubber renew in order to be even moderately useful. But it's grippier now than it was. I will give that for it. Let me get the Windex out and I'm going to clean that. Just to be sure. It's doing better than it was. Now it's not doing anything. What the heck? It was working a second ago. What the hell? After all the time I spent on this thing, dang thing literally just quit again. Something else popped while it was getting its pinch roller cleaned or something. I'll try a tape, but I don't know. I might be all done with this thing. Absolutely frustrating. Let me get the meter out, guys. I want to see if the uh, motor is actually getting power. Oh no, wait, meter is not, or motor is not getting power. Why is motor not getting power? Let me reconnect the tuner here. Yeah, motor is getting like 18 volts. Motor just quit. Great. Like I need this yet today. It's not a bad soldering issue. I think the motor just done cooked itself, is what's going on here. And because this is a clockwise motor, I do not have a replacement for it. Ain't that nice? The bigger question I have is why is the power supply running at 18 volts? It shouldn't be, and yet all this voltage comes off of the main windings of the transformer. So I don't know what the heck is going on with this thing. I just know I'm about done with it is all. All I know. Oh, well, that is frustrating, but that's how it goes sometimes. Well, folks, I think I might have actually found it. I'm not entirely sure. This thing's really confusing, but uh, I realized that while the schematics for the power supply in the archive don't match my unit, the power supply schematics on this side do match my unit. So I was able to make a little bit of progress. I did some checking first. This capacitor right here, I measured 15 volts across it, which is exactly what this unit should be running at. That capacitor is, if I can show you, 
it is where is it right there and I checked this capacitor to see what voltage was across there and I got 18 volts which is not what this should be running at as you can clearly see she's got 15 volts there and it goes 15 volts all the way around the unit see that's the same rail right there so with that in mind, I asked myself, how could this thing be running at 18 volts and this thing be running at 15 volts? Well, I took a look a little closer here, and look at that right there. R482, 3.9 mega ohms. That is the only possible explanation I can think of for this unit running the 15 volt rail so hot. I'll show you where it is. That's it right there. And it tests good somehow. However, I suspect it's failed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace that. I'm going to have to order one, obviously, and then we'll see if that brings that rail under control. If it does, I can pull out one of my Chinese knockoff capstan motors, pull it apart, reverse the, the polarity on it, and I would then be able to use it in this machine to go clockwise instead of counterclockwise. And I should be able to get the cassette deck working. Now, whether or not that will fix the tuner, I have serious doubts about that. I have no idea what happened to this thing while it was running 18 volts. There could be something else wrong inside the unit, and at that point, I don't think I'd be interested in finding it. So, uh, yeah, there will be an update on this unit, an update video. We'll try to replace that resistor, see if that brings the 15-volt rail in line. We'll replace the Q109 to see if it brings the tuner back, and uh, yeah, hopefully that brings it back in working order. If not, it's just going to be auxiliary input only, and it's going to stay the way it is, and probably be a parts unit at some point. But yeah, that's going to be it for today, guys. I'll see you in the next video. Take care.